All right, <clears throat> great. So my name is Max Joseph, and today I'm gonna to be talking about neural networks as drop-in function approximators for ecological models. If you only remember one thing from this talk, it's that if you've got a model with something like x times beta, like a design matrix times a parameter vector, that's approximating a function, and if you want to, you can replace that with a neural network, and I'll tell you how. But first, let's, let's think a little bit about what a hierarchical model is. These are models that are widely used in ecology, um, and the, the basic idea is that we have some observations, but we really are interested in estimating states and parameters. The observations themselves aren't necessarily telling us what we really want to know. And so hierarchical model sort of decomposes um, what we know into these parameters, states, and the observations depend on both. One common example in ecology would be an occupancy model. So here we have some detection data, um, but we know that if we fail to detect a species in a location, it doesn't necessarily mean that that site is unoccupied. It may have actually been occupied, but we just failed to detect it. And so the data here are the detections. Uh, the states are binary, so Z is either 0 or 1 if it's not occupied or occupied. And the parameters are P, the probability of detection, and Psi, the probability of occupancy. Parameters in these models can depend on covariates. So for example, maybe we want the occupancy probability to depend on the fraction of forest or the elevation. Um, often we use linear assumptions here, uh, maybe on like a transformed scale, like a logit scale but um, still like the mapping from our predictors x to the parameter we care about uh, is represented just using these, these slopes, essentially. Um, that said, you know, we can accommodate nonlinearity. There are many approaches that are widely used in ecology that can do this, um, including polynomials, splines, random fields, Gaussian processes, tree-based methods. Uh, this talk is gonna be about neural networks, but this is really just one function approximation approach that's thrown onto the heap of existing approaches. I want to make special mention of tree-based function approximators in hierarchical models. Um, you know, over a decade ago, Rebecca Hutchinson and her colleagues demonstrated that you could inject a boosted regression tree into an occupancy model um, and end up with this like sort of hybrid machine learning hierarchical model approach. Um, and just a little bit of speculation, like this approach uh, is probably going to be a really good bet if you've got tabular features, like if the features in X don't have a lot of spatial structure or temporal structure. Uh, based on what we know about tabular machine learning in general, this approach may be um, sort of best in class. But this talks about neural networks, so um, just a quick introduction. Neural networks are just function approximators, so you've got some inputs X, and you're feeding those inputs to the network the neural network here is, is sort of represented by these green nodes in this graph. This, is, this would be like a hidden layer. That hidden layer then pack, uh, maps to y hat, which would be observable data. Some examples here would be bounding boxes for object detection, species identity, uh, key points for like a facial um, pose detection, a number, or maybe words if you're doing some language model. But neural networks can do a lot more than just predict data. For example, you might imagine a neural network that instead of predicting some observable data, predicts some unobservable parameter theta. And we can give a concrete example here by injecting a neural network into an occupancy model. So here, we're actually predicting the probability of occupancy psi uh, using a neural network. And this neural network can be a part of an occupancy model and you end up with something like a a neural occupancy model that gives you the function approximation of a neural network, but the observation model uh, corresponding to an occupancy model. So you can account for imperfect detection. It's often the case that um, hierarchical models are developed because data are imperfect. So occupancy models are an example where non-detection doesn't imply absence. An n-mixture model is motivated by the fact that uh, the count observations that you make are not the same thing as abundance, capture, recapture. If you don't capture something, it doesn't mean it's dead. For animal movement models, where something is doesn't tell you the behavioral state. So these are all examples of hierarchical models that are motivated by imperfect data. And there are more examples. These are just some common ones. 
And we can start to think about like, where do models fall in terms of um, their flexibility and function approximation on the x-axis here and the complexity of the observation model on the y-axis here. So in the lower left-hand quadrant, you might imagine linear regression and maybe generalized additive models as like relatively simple function approximators, super simple observation models because you can observe the thing that you're trying to predict. In the lower right-hand quadrant, I might throw in Gaussian process regression, um, some more deep learning approaches like image classification and object detection where we've got really flexible function approximation and still you can observe the thing that you're trying to predict. Now in the upper left hand quadrant, we might throw in some common hierarchical models that are used in ecology. Often these are using really simple function approximators like x times beta, a linear assumption, but the observation models are complex because we can't actually observe the thing that we care about. In occupancy, we can't necessarily directly observe presence and absence all the time. For an integrated population model, we may be interested in estimating some demographic rates from a, a really diverse set of data. Um, and so we have to have this really complex observation model. And if we inject a neural network into one of these hierarchical models, essentially what we will be doing is taking a model from the upper left-hand quadrant and pushing it into the upper right-hand quadrant. So here's an example of a convolutional animal movement model. This is a simulated example. On the left-hand side, I've got a simulated movement trajectory of an animal that likes to forage in canopies of trees. So the sort of viridis map on the back shows canopy height, and this animal has two behavioral states. One would be foraging within a tree, one would be in transit, moving from tree to tree. And let's assume that all we have access to is uh, maybe some aerial imagery and the locations of the animal shown here on the right. So how can we use this information to actually estimate how the environment relates to the behavioral states of an animal? One thing we can do is take a hidden Markov model, which is commonly used in animal movement, um, where we've got some latent behavioral states that we're relating to the observations, and we're modeling the transition probabilities from state to state as a function of an image, spatial data, structured image data around each point location. So here there's a convolutional neural network that ingests a raster and outputs a transition probability matrix. And you can build this all into one model, train the model, and that model can actually learn just based on the movement trajectory of an animal that it's more likely to transition to an in-transit state over bare ground and more likely to transition into a foraging state over trees. So at no point have we actually labeled trees not trees for this ConvNet. In fact, it's just learning this information from the movement trajectory of an animal. So how do we actually train these models? Um, for the most part, the easiest thing you can do is to minimize loss in terms of like a negative log likelihood or a negative log probability. Um, and if you can decompose your data into conditionally independent data points, you can use stochastic mini-batch optimization, where you're just feeding in mini-batches of data one at a time. This allows you to scale to really, really large data sets. But of course, there are trade-offs. Like, why should you not do this? Um, well, the good thing about these kinds of models is we know that um, neural networks are really good at extracting features from images and time series. They're super scalable if you can use stochastic gradient descent. But the not so good things are like they're not immediately as interpretable as a linear model. The implementation is is kind of uh, complex, like you've got to write some bespoke uh, machine learning code and posterior sampling is incredibly tricky. So point estimates are easy to get, posterior samples not so much. All right, so we talked about how you can take a complex observation model, inject a neural network and introduce some more flexible function approximation. Uh, but there's another way to end up in that upper right hand quadrant, which would be to take something like an object detection model, let's say like a camera trap model that detects species and move it up into the complex observation model space. And this is going to allow us to estimate um, ecological states, ecological parameters, etc. All right, but in order to do that, we've got to think about like, what is the observation model for these kinds of classifiers? So here's an example of a camera trap. Uh, a model has identified individual animals here and, and attached these um, species identities or predicted species classes to each one. 
So how can we take this kind of output and, and build an observation model? How do, we, how do we deal with classifier output as data? Um, I would argue this is actually like a, a more interesting and more broadly applicable question than how do we inject a neural network into an existing ecological model. So one example uh, of how to do this is given by this paper by Anna Spears et al. Um, and the basic idea is we observe the total number of encounters with animals, that would be n, like how many animals did we observe? Um, and we're assuming that that relates to an encounter rate for each species, which would be theta k, and a binary latent occupancy state zk for each species. We also observe the output from our classifier, which would be yi. So for every encounter, the classifier gives us a prediction of you know, what is the species identity there. But we know that these classifiers are imperfect, right? And so for a subset of those encounters, we are going to observe the true label. Like you feed this to um, an expert labeler. And so the true species identity of each encounter, this is this K bracket I, um, is observed in some cases. And we can build all of this into one model that critically links the output from a classifier, YI, to ecological parameters that we actually care about, which would be like the occupancy state Z or the encounter rate lambda. Um, and so this is a really interesting sort of new class of models that um, I hope we can continue to, to riff on and develop. There are a couple of considerations here, like as we imagine, you know, how do you treat about, how do you treat classifier output as data? Uh, we have to think hard about what happens with out of distribution samples. As a human, it's easy to see an animal and say, oh, I don't know what that is. But a machine learning model might not have the capacity to say, I don't know what this animal is. It, it instead might give you uh, the wrong prediction. Another consideration would be like, do we want to use the hard versus soft label? So a hard label would be like the predicted class. The soft label would be the vector of class probabilities. And there's more information in those soft labels, um, but potentially we have to build a more complex model to use that information. Third, there are correlated errors, right? There could be spatial, temporal, spatiotemporal correlation in errors from a model. How do we actually model those errors and these kinds of uh, approaches. And then finally, calibration. It's, it's fairly well known that not all machine learning models are well calibrated, and so we may have to think about um, you know, how do you deal with that in, a, in an observation model. Some more practical questions um, when we're thinking about model output as data is like, how do you label data in a way that is optimal? For instance, like if you've got some fixed time budget to label some images, which images are going to give you the most information about the ecological states that you care about? Um, another question would be like, should you use a two-stage approach where you first train a classifier and then feed the output to a separate model as data? Or is it better to just build one integrated model that has your image classifier embedded within an ecological model? And so I mentioned earlier that imperfect data often motivate hierarchical models. And this is just another example, right? Um, the output from a classifier is imperfect data in the sense that the classifier output might not always be exactly the same as the true species identity. And so this class of models um, is referred to, this is borrowing a term from Andy Royal, as a coupled classification model. Um, and I think it represents a really sort of uh, intriguing and, and important uh, area for quantitative ecology to be uh, pointing towards. Thanks. Uh, with that, if you want to get in touch, you can shoot me an email, uh, catch me on Twitter. All of the code for these models is on GitHub. There's a binder link if you want to actually go in and experiment. Um, and then if you want to dig really deep, there's a paper on this, Neurohierarchical Models of Ecological Populations.